I'm Dr. Kaino uh, from Tanzania. I used to be the head of department of uh, anesthesia and intensive care uh, at Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center in northern Tanzania, which is a 700-bed hospital uh, with a catchment population of about 15 million people. I have um, about 10-year history with uh, Lifebox, and um, I have a personal story here I would like to share with you. And this is Lifebox, a true story from the receiving end, uh, a decade-long story. Uh, it's a short presentation that just gives perspectives uh, of collaborating with Lifebox at, at a hospital level uh, rather than other talks that have been given to elaborate Lifebox impact at a global level. <coughs> so this is, this is Tanzania. I'll just pick up um, a pointer here. This is, this is the map of Africa and this is Tanzania over here. It's on East Africa. And this is the country we have two centers. This is the capital of the commercial capital in Tanzania, and this is the political capital. And the hospital we're going to talk about is right at the border with Kenya. It's called Kilimanjaro, near the Kilimanjaro mountain. These are a bit of demographics in Tanzania, uh, comparing that to uh, demographics in, in the US. The population is about 56 million people. That's uh, uh, a large country. and. Comparing that to U.S., which has a population of about 323 million people. And look at the number of doctors in Tanzania. We have one doctor for every 33,000 people, while in the U.S. is about one doctor to every 390 uh, population. So the numbers of doctors in Tanzania is very low. And this is comparing Tanzania to other East African countries. So these are the... Uh, uh, GDP of, uh, of Tanzania. It's uh, a little bit below Kenyan, but it's higher than Mozambique, as you can see here. And this is the uh, <coughs> healthcare system, the way it stands in, in Tanzania. You have the village health services, dispensary services, health center services, and then you have the district hospitals. And then from the district hospitals, patients can be referred to regional hospitals and then to consultant hospitals, which are three one in the north, one in the lake zone, and one in south zone. And then all of these can refer patients to the national hospital, which is called Mohimbili, located in Dar es Salaam. Now, anesthesia capacity in Tanzania. Uh, training physicians in Tanzania is, it takes about three to four years. Uh, that is a residency training program in anesthesia. We call it MMED, which is Master of Medicine in Anesthesiology. And postgraduate degrees and trainees must pay their fees themselves or look for sponsorship independently. And currently we have about 50 anesthesiologists in a country with uh, 56 million people. That accounts for about 0.08 uh, anesthesiologists per 100,000 population. That's very low comparing to the U.S. And uh, we have also non-physician anesthetists like assistant medical officers who train for two years to do anesthesia. And we have nurse anesthetists who completes one year a program to become nurse anesthetist and we have a lot of varying uh, duration in duration of uh, uh, on-job training for nurse anesthetists as well. So this is the hospital we're talking about. It's Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center. It's located on the on the slopes of uh, mountain Kilimanjaro as you can see at the back there. So Kilimanjaro was KCMC, which is Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center, was established in 1971. It's a tertiary referral teaching hospital uh, for Tumaini University, so it's a teaching hospital as well. And uh, it has a catchment population of about 15 million people, so it's a large hospital with about 700 beds. Uh, it has 26 bed ICU, 14 uh, surgical ICU, and six uh, medical ICUs, and uh, six beds of pediatric ICUs and it has about 14 operating rooms. The organogram is very complicated but basically it's just uh, it's co-owned by the government and the church so things get a little bit complicated when it comes to that due to dual ownership. Uh, we have departments about 16 of them and uh, Many of them are surgical, like ENT, urology, and uh, obstetric and gynecology, orthopedic general surgery. But we also have the Department of Anesthesia and Intensive Care. So my training personal, my personal story, is that I trained uh, for medical education in Ukraine for seven years uh, using Russian language. Uh, and then 
I trained for anesthesia, postgraduate, like residence training program in anesthesia at Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center. It was a sandwich program, so I did some courses like regional anesthesia and emergency medicine in the Netherlands and uh, emergency medicine and critical care in, in English Guyana for about four months. So when I started in 2010, during my residence training program, uh, the anesthesia provided at this big hospital where uh, poorly trained, uh, very elderly people, uh, most of them were retired and working on contracts, and uh, we had very limited monitoring. So you would gas down a three-day-old uh, baby with imperforate anus for colostomy raising uh, only on a precordial stethoscope, not any other monitoring. So you just look, you use your, your fingers to, to puppet the pulse and use precordial stethoscope to listen to the heart and look at blood whether it's turning blue or not. And then we had very old malfunctioning machines which had no mechanical ventilation and uh, we did not have monitors and we did not have, uh, so because of that we couldn't do a low flow uh, anesthesia. So it was very expensive for them to do high flow anesthesia. We used to run uh, oxygen at about six liters per minute for all the operations. And then no analgesia, zero analgesia was given to patients. So you needed very deep anesthesia to, to, prov to keep the patients asleep. And we had very poor guidelines for airway management. This is when I started my residency. And this is just an example of the machines and the setup the way it was. In other rooms, you will have one monitor which is capable to take only uh, blood pressure, another one only pulse oximeter, and another one only uh, for uh, ECG. And so you'll have three monitors, each taking one parameter, and others are either malfunctioning or just uh, not functioning at all. So you can see this machine has no, uh, the ventilator is here, but it's not working. You have ether bottle and another one is for halothen. So I became head of department immediately after I graduated my residency in 2015. And it was obvious that we had a lot to do. And most of the things that we had to do there did not require a million dollars, but just a million ideas from different people. So I opened the doors for collaboration and we started having international collaborations. Uh, including Lifebox, WFSA, uh, with which we ran the self causes, self obstetric causes. And uh, I had uh, collaborations with St. Radbard University in Holland, where we, we received uh, some donation of machines and operating tables. So we're going to take a look at, a closer look at how we collaborated with Lifebox. This was one of the key collaborations that I had uh, in the five in the five years that I was head of department uh, in this hospital. And it surrounded uh, the, the Lifebox Fellows. They were the cornerstone of the, the partnership. So we, we started receiving fellows in 2010 with Dr. Ruth Tai, who was very energetic uh, physician with a lot of <laughs> uh, initiatives. And uh, up to date, we have already received five fellows. So a fellow is a senior registrar in the UK or a senior resident in the US who come to low middle income countries to, uh, and stay for six months to assist with quality improvement projects. So let's take a look at what we did with uh, these five fellows in the past five years. So number one was uh, pass oximetry. Uh, they facilitated donation of about 200 pass oximeters to my hospital. Uh, so we did not use all the 200 pass oximeters. Some went to, because it's a training center for nurse anesthetists, and every nurse anesthetist who graduate from our school of anesthesia, they graduate with the pass oximeter uh, that they take to their uh, remotely located health center where they'll be practicing. Uh, cesarean sections and attending to uh, open fractures and acute abdomen and use that to monitor patients. Uh, believe me or not, but in most of these centers, it's either a life box oximeter or nothing. A life box oximeter or just a precordial stethoscope and fingers on a purse and looking at blood whether it turns blue or not. So it, is, it, it was a very valuable uh, piece of device 
uh, for these students who are graduating, going back to their, to their hospitals. And at KSMC, you can see now the changes that we started having. Uh, you can see we have this machine with so many monitors on top of it, and all of them cannot take pulse oximetry. They cannot measure pulse oximetry. So we have, we have this yellow magical device here to serve that purpose. And even when we changed the machines to modern ones, still we relied on the same uh, pulse oximeter here because sometimes uh, the probes of this uh, good monitor could not pick uh, pulse from, from small children. So we use the Lifebox pulse oximeter regardless of having this large good monitor over there. And then you can see the changes even in medical records. So we have this anesthetic chart but as you can see, just I want you to focus down here. I want you to focus down here. Look at this one and that one. And you, you can see that, you see this right circle there? There's no saturations recorded because there was no pass oximetry at that particular time. And if you go to the next, you can see saturations recorded down there. I wish I, I had a way to zoom it in so that you can see. But that's the story and it is well documented even in the medical reports as well. Another uh, project that we did with the fellows and with Lifebox is a surgical checklist. So we instituted surgical checklist at Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center, which also brought a lot of changes in the way we practice. It reduced the cancellation of cases and increased uh, theater output uh, and also improved the uh, team cohesion uh, during, during surgeries. And now it is well taken in and it is being uh, done on a daily basis. One of the uh, <coughs> uh, obstacles that we faced when we were introducing the surgical checklist at Kilimanjaro was like, uh, this is extra expense on the stationery, so we're going to use more papers. And uh, one of the solutions that I gave them is that we have the... So in that way, sometimes it will be there, sometimes it will not be there. Whether depending on whether they, they, they have papers to print it or not. And, uh, but the consent was always there. The consent for surgery was always there. And it was printed only on one side of the sheet. So I gave them a suggestion to print the consent, the uh, surgical checklist on overleaf on the other side of the. So it was always there and it will always be there. Another thing that we did with fellows, Lifebox fellows, is training. So <coughs> number one, which is very important, is that we applied for third funding from the UK government. And we used that to develop a national curriculum for nurse anesthetists, at least to start developing it. So we used that funding to have the fellow on ground, who is Ruth Tai. And then uh, Ruth Tai organized situational analysis. Yeah. For, uh, for developing, directed at developing the national curriculum. And then we started developing the uh, national uh, curriculum for nurse anesthetists. Uh, we took it to the ministry and the ministry gave us directions and called all stakeholders. And we finished this uh, exercise. We now have the national curriculum for training nurse anesthetists. It's a four year program, which, is, which leads to uh, a qualification of Bachelor of Science in nursing with anesthesia. So it's a four-year program and it is starting this year at the National Hospital, at the National University, Medical University in Dar es Salaam. So just a bit of history behind that is that all nurse anesthetists practicing in, in Tanzania as of now, they're not recognized by the government because their training has not been standard. There was no curriculum for training them. It's a one-year training and uh, they don't have a scheme of service and they don't have a, a career progression out of that. But with this new curriculum, we will have scheme of service and we'll have career progression for the nurses. So they will be recognized in the country. Another bit of training that we did uh, with the help from the fellows is that for the first time, we introduced the WFSA self-obstetric courses. So uh, uh, this, was, uh, this had already been done in other countries like Kenya, Uganda, Zambia, and they had done it like uh, seven times, eight times, and they had, they had finished it. Uh, 
uh, and they were looking for other endeavors to partner with WFSN. But Tanzania had not started even a single cause. But with help from the fellows, we actually invited WFSA to Tanzania. And the first cause was, was conducted in Kirimanjaro. And then we took the next cause to Mwanza in the Lake Zone. And then uh, after that point in time, the uh, uh, Tanzanian Society of Anesthesiology, SATA, decided to adopt this program and now they're running it. And then for the first time, we also organized the first Nurse Anesthesia Conference in the country. Uh, this is very important because about 95% of all anesthesia provision, all anesthesia services in Tanzania is, is done by nurse anesthetists. So we cannot ignore this workforce, at least uh, at this particular time. So we organized all of them because we organized all of them to come together and, and share you know, knowledge and skills and exchange experiences, etc. And then we organized ourselves together with the fellows and we had our first simulation laboratory, uh, the first in the country at Kirimanjaro Christian Medical Center. And then a year later on, uh, uh, we had another one being built at the National uh, Medical University in Dar es Salaam. But the first one was at uh, Kilimanjaro, and during that time we had already trained about 200 nurse anesthetists. It's a very powerful, very immersive uh, way of teaching uh, people with very good uh, results. So all of this together was to actually brand and, and advocate and, and uh, market anesthesia as a profession in that part of the world where it was actually totally ignored. So it was uh, despised and ignored by, uh, even by administrators, by medical students, by uh, residents and by surgeons. So you don't expect a medical student to specialize in anesthesia after they graduate if all they see is something being underlooked. So through these measures, we actually uh, upgraded the look uh, of anesthesia in, in that community. And now we have a lot of uh, graduating medical doctors who are already either specializing in anesthesia or wishing to specialize in anesthesia. They were also involved in quality improvement projects, so promulgating protocols, guidelines, checklists, algorithms, uh, and, and these are just uh, a summary of what we did with the fellows, including pain protocol, uh, errors in obstetric and laparoscopic surgeries, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result of this, now the hospital is preparing a daycare surgical unit because now we have the means, anesthetic means, to care for these patients and be able to, 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 to send them home uh, after a, a daycare surgery. So they were also involved in training nurses, like reading lectures on a daily basis, uh, supervising uh, journal clubs, etc., etc., uh, to medical students, residents, as well as in-service nurses. Uh, so where are we right now in 2019? We have about 50% of the providers are nurses, and we have 50% new employees. Remember I told you uh, when I took office it was like, uh, almost 100% were retirees, very old, uh, poorly trained uh, nurse anesthetists, but now we have 50% uh, of new uh, nurse anesthetists and we have about 50% of the providers are uh, residents who are physicians. And then we have acquired refurbished anesthesia machines from Holland, uh, which have uh, full patient monitors, including capnography, temperature, ECG, etc. And so we can, and they have mechanical means for mechanical ventilation. And so we can, um, we can do low floor uh, anesthesia. And that have provided uh, uh, a venue to save about 70% of the, the cost that was uh, previously lost through high floor anesthesia, lack of uh, analgesia and other things. And then we have also pass oximetry and modern monitoring, uh, regional anesthesia and modern anesthesia. Uh, analgesia uh, for the patients, so we have a very good balanced anesthesia there. Uh, Post-operative nausea and vomiting management. Uh, we have updated protocols in better record keeping. 
Uh, we'll have new anesthetic charts and um, a PACQ, PACQ record charts as well. We have better airway management with ETTs. Um, is, uh, so this is, could be a little bit surprising to others, but uh, previously what used to happen is that patients get uh, a loading dose of ketamine and because they keep on breathing then there's no airway protection, they don't get intubated and surgery can take place without airway protection. But now we have uh, ETT, uh, patients are being intubated and the airways are being protected well. And we have, we have established sustainable procurement systems uh, of consumables and other drugs. So this is just one example of the uh, record keeping that we have developed. This is a new chart, anesthesia chart. And beyond 2019, we look forward, because all the low-hanging fruits are almost, are almost done, so we look forward to, we face more new challenges, like uh, that need more time, need more money, need a, a more structured approach and long-term commitment. Uh, and so uh, we, we, need to, we need to look forward to institutional collaborations uh, with our partners in the developing world so that we can share their experiences uh, sometimes just a million ideas that are needed and not a million dollars uh, in order to better shape anesthesia and make it safe for uh, obstetric patients, pediatric patients and other patients in the third world. Thank you for listening.